Welcome, everyone. My name is Ilva Tare, and I'm a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council in Washington, DC. I am thrilled to be hosting Balkans Debrief, a new talk show presented by the Atlantic Council's Europe Center. Balkans Debrief will feature in-depth analysis and exclusive insights with policymakers and key players on subjects impacting more than 18 million people. Born and raised in Albania, I have led, had the privilege to lead newsrooms for more than 20 years. This has made me witness to all the traumas and persistent pathologies that have haunted the region. The West has long worked on helping the people of the Western Balkans build a better future, but with mixed success and results. The country's democracies are shaky at best, corruption is high, and their small economies are not integrated well with each other, leading to a scarcity of foreign investment. Joining Europe, though, remains a shared aspiration for most of the people of the Western Balkan countries. But their dream keeps getting purposely deferred due both to lack of progress on reforms and to political games in the EU capitals. The Ukraine war represents a pivotal moment for Europe. Will its leaders rethink EU enlargement? Will enlargement happen at all? And what does that mean for the Western Balkans? Gerald Knoes is the founding chairman of the Stability, European Stability Initiative, and I am delighted to have him as a guest with us today to talk about these issues. Gerald, thank you for joining me today on Europe Day. You have been doing an excellent work on how to overcome the impasse of enlargement. Will Ukraine war, uh, according to you, serve as a new momentum for the EU to get the enlargement out of the so-called clinically dead category? You have been pushing for years now to start uh, a staged accession, uh, an open EU to single market, uh, to the six Balkan countries, the way uh, that uh, Sweden, Finland and Austria did in 1994. Can you please give us a readout of your proposal? Well, uh, first of all, good evening and thank you for the invitation for this chance uh, to the Atlantic Council and to you. Yes, this is a pivotal moment. I just came from Moldova today, a country uh, that has applied for joining the European Union and where all the civil servants I met, all the ministers I met, are at the moment answering the questions to get candidate status. I talked to friends who've just come from Kiev in Ukraine, where, of course, uh, the Ukrainians have beaten all records in answering the questions that the Commission sent them for candidate status in one week. Uh, there are meetings this whole week. I have meetings tomorrow here in Berlin at the Chancellery, at the Foreign Ministry. There are discussions at the G7 meeting uh, of foreign ministers in Germany in a few days where again, the Ukrainians and the Moldovans will be talking about enlargement. And what all of this means is that suddenly, because of the tragedy of Russia's aggression against Ukraine, and because of the bravery of Ukrainian defenders and the European aspirations of these leaders, we have now a very big choice for European leaders to be made, which is how to respond to the Ukrainian and Moldovan applications for membership. And this completely transforms a debate that we've had on the Balkans, which, to be honest, has become completely stale in the last 10 years. Uh, I mean, if we are honest, we must recognize that the promise made to the Balkans in 2003, 19 years ago, this summer in Thessaloniki, that the future of the Western Balkan countries is in the EU, this promise, 19 years later, has resulted in a situation where of the six Western Balkan countries, four are not even negotiating, 19 years after this promise was made. And two are negotiating, Montenegro and Serbia, without any chance of getting closer to actually joining. Mm -hmm. Montenegro but has been negotiating for 10 years. Now yes, that's a record. Are also. the EU so, countries honest? Yes. Do they really want enlargement? Do they push towards that? Do they want it? No, no, I mean, no, the reason they are, the short answer is no, and the long answer is a bit more complicated. Well, EU countries have, and some of its leaders, and of course you need 27 to agree, have made very, very, very clear already years ago 
In 2019, President Macron, I mean, people just haven't listened to what he said. He said, the EU needs to change first before it can accept any new members. Now you can disagree with him, but the point is this is France and other countries in the EU agree. The German chancellor, Olaf Scholz, has said the same thing. The EU needs to reform so that it can accept new members. Now, we know EU reform is extremely difficult if it involves treaty change, if not impossible. So the result has been that the EU has had a Balkan accession process for two of the six countries, which has become the longest drawn out process of negotiations, leading nowhere. I mean, it is very similar to the accession talks that the EU is leading with Turkey. So you asked me what we propose. We propose to be realistic and honest. The EU needs the Balkans to be prosperous, stable, and integrated. The Balkan economies need to be integrated into the single European market. Otherwise, they stand no chance of catching up, of doing what Romania, the Baltic states, Poland and Slovakia did so successfully, converging with the average per capita income of the rest of the EU. So there is an interest on both sides for a real process of integration. But if this process of integration cannot be accomplished for political reasons that are clearly stated in one go, well, then we should look back to the experiences of the past and say, let's make it a two-step process, where the first step, which is offering all the Western Balkan countries and Ukraine and Moldova the chance to join the single market and to enjoy the four freedoms where people can move across the EU as Balkan citizens in the way Norwegians, Icelanders, or indeed Romanians and Bulgarians can, mm -hmm. where businesses, capital, goods move freely. Let's work on realizing this promise of single market integration in the next four years. And that means opening talks with every one of the Western Balkan countries on all the issues related to the single market and promising each of those countries that they can join a new economic community with the European Union that guarantees the four freedoms, as long, of course, as they also meet the Copenhagen criteria of democracy and the rule of law. Now, this is doable. We've been presenting this to a lot of leaders. I was in Paris, I was in Berlin, in the Chancellery. We've been presenting it in other European capitals. But most importantly, this is something that the EU can also present to Ukraine. And then it's an offer that Balkan countries can look at and say, do we want this to join the single market in the next few years or not? And of course, it's up to each of them to choose. So, girl, let me get this straight. You're saying a first stage single market and then does this will lead to EU membership? Because I think the Western Balkan countries or other yes. countries may this be afraid that this is it for them. There is no membership. Well, this is where we are right now is no membership right now. Uh, Albania has been stuck as a candidate for a very long time, and there is not even an attempt to give a, a justification. Why is the EU not negotiating with Albania? There's no veto by anyone. They've even stopped trying to explain it. And why has the EU opened every chapter with Montenegro, and yet nobody in the EU will tell you that Montenegro can join in the next four years? Why? So they've given up even justifying the policy. What we say is, let's get real. If all of these countries are getting the kind of attention from the European Commission to reform their institutions, to get the kind of financial support that is necessary that Romania or other countries got in the pre-accession period, to get the kind of feedback and promise of a realistic goal of fully enjoying the four freedoms when they meet the criteria, then we have a transformative project. And once these countries are in the single market, like Finland, like Austria, like Sweden in uh, 1993, 
then it's just a political decision in the European Union, which today the EU is not ready to take, but perhaps then it is ready in four years or in five years, whether to let them in as full members. But if the EU in five years, and that's the worst case scenario, like now, is not ready because it has not changed, well, at least at that stage, these countries have not lost another four years and are fully integrated, like Norway and Iceland, in the single market. I agree. And that exactly. would be yeah. transformative. <laughs> Mm -hmm. No, I do agree. And actually, the EU should restore some credibility also in this process after all these years, as you said, of impasse on the enlargement uh, process. You said that you have been uh, meeting and uh, uh, European uh, officials and it seems that there is a moment, there is a traction for your work here. What does the EU have to do to make single uh, market possible? And I have a question on that. How do you think uh, should be done, considering that the EU is pushing for um, common regional market through RCC. And also there is another initiative in the region, the Open Balkans. What do you think uh, is the right approach? Well, I mean, a regional cooperation is always a, a good thing, but it can't replace joining the biggest single market in the world. So, you know, Open Balkans, it's a good thing, but it's only three countries that take part. Why not? But it is not the same thing as having full and free and border free trade investment, uh, uh, no, no obstacles, non-tariff barriers of any kind between Albania or Serbia or North Macedonia and the EU. So um, what we are proposing goes far beyond that. Uh, so why is this now possible? Because Ukraine is pushing for two things. Ukraine wants candidate status to be uh, giving a signal that they can one day join. That's symbolic, it's important, but it's symbolic. But they also want to push for some negotiations to start because they know they will need to rebuild their country. And if they just get candidate status like Turkey in 99 and then nothing happens, well, that will not help Ukraine rebuild its economy. So Ukraine is pushing for something real. If the EU gives something real to Ukraine, then there are countries in the EU uh, Greece, Austria, Hungary, and others that are already saying, well, listen, if we give this to Ukraine, we must also give something to the Balkans. And that's a good thing. And then we have countries like France or the Netherlands that have been skeptical of new members of the EU who can then be told, listen, if you support single market integration over the next few years, then we have what you've asked for, a two-stage process. So we get all these countries to become closer. Most importantly, uh, you know, at the moment, the European Commission president, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, is pressing very, very hard on Ukraine being given something real. And we need a very strong and committed commission. We didn't have it in the last few years in the Balkans. The commission was not really believing very much in its project itself. If the commission believes in this and starts working on this with all its civil servants in the next five years, it can be transformative. So this is a moment in the next few days, in the next few weeks, until I hope the end of June, um, we need the leaders of the European Union to propose the creation. And we propose, let's sign a new Treaty of Rome for recreating a European economic community with all democracies that meet the Copenhagen criteria of rule of law and uh, human rights and meet the conditions for joining the single market and then have them fully integrated in the near future with full support from the European Commission. That's realistic, it's Girl, transformative, it would you be clearly, historic, yeah, and it's You possible. clearly state in your proposal the rule of law, fighting corruption uh, in the Western Balkan countries becomes at this point central. What kind of reforms should the Western Balkan countries have to implement before joining the single market? And how can the results be measured and monitored by the EU? Because I think this is the problem also. Yes, because when you join uh, the single market, uh, you need strong and credible institutions so that the common rules are enforced also on your territory, in your country, by your independent courts. And otherwise it doesn't work. You know, because in the end, it's about accepting whatever is being produced in Serbia or in Albania and 
knowing that the inspectors, the regulatory institutions, cannot be bribed, will not be corrupted. And if they are, there will be an independent judicial system to go after them. So this is crucial. This is in, in a, absolutely essential. But let's not pretend that this hasn't happened before. I mean, we've had a lot of enlargements. And when I look at the experience of Romania, for example, there has been tremendous change in Romania in recent years. We've had prime ministers being indicted and sentenced to jail. We've had many mayors being sentenced to jail. We've had a lot of anti-corruption efforts. Cor Corruption will not stop when you join the EU. There's corruption in Germany, in Italy, in Belgium, in Austria. But what you need is credible, strong institutions, as we saw recently in Austria, where prosecutors investigated also government ministers. So what the EU needs to see in the next few years is a track record on this. But what changes with the promise of joining the single market is that the business community in each country will then push the politicians to actually achieve the goal. They will make investments. They will want to enjoy them. So there will be a domestic lobby to actually fulfill the conditions, including the rule of mm -hmm. law, that at the moment, local leaders have very few incentives to do unpopular reforms. At the moment, there is, I mean, you, know, you, you read what leaders in the region have been saying the last few years. They're making fun of accession. You know, they are, and they can be quite witty, you know. Um, Eddie Rama making yeah, fun of the bride Yeah, I know, the bride that's waiting for the or, uh, yeah. family of the husband. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But, but I mean, but, that's, that's very sad because what you really want is Albania to be as successful with its young population catching up uh, as Estonia. And there's no reason why it shouldn't be if it is treated the same way. To conclude, uh, how optimistic are you that this single market will come to life? And uh, I'm sure you followed Emmanuel Macron uh, uh, stands to say talking uh, about uh, completely a sweeping vision he, he spoke about a new broader european political economical community is it the same with your eu single market and what would you say to a group of people who think that this is uh, a new opportunity a new alternative for other countries to become member or others that sees this uh, declaration of macron as a, a door slammed in their faces for the new membership especially the Western Balkans? Well, first of all, as we've discussed, no door is being slammed because at the moment no door is open. I mean, let's just be very clear. Uh, even in the last few years, none of the countries is moving closer to actually joining. So we need to open doors. Uh, what President Macron has been saying, and I've had many meetings in Paris in recent years and including recently, um, and there is interest in the French administration in these ideas that uh, we've also tried to argue for. These are very French ideas. This is what was invented by Jacques Delors for Austria and Sweden and Finland. Uh, he was then the French commission president. And what President Macron has said uh, in recent, in, in, today, uh, but also indicated in recent, in recent weeks, uh, could go very much in this direction. And uh, I know from conversations here in Germany, in Berlin, um, that this might also be an answer to the Ukrainian question. Because Ukraine uh, wants to get a statement that it can join the EU, but it doesn't want symbolism alone. That doesn't help the country. Mm -hmm. It needs to know that over the near future, it could be uh, part of the single market like Poland. And if this is an answer to Ukraine, well, then it's only natural that it will be offered to the Balkans. And let's, again, yep. just stress, this would be an offer. If a country in the Balkans says we don't want to join the single market, well, it can't be forced. But I think once there is a fair and credible offer, every country in the Balkans will see that that is a good thing to transform their economies and to make European integration something real for citizens and their businesses. Definitely. Thank you, Gerard Knaus, and thank you for your optimism about the enlargement, especially about this two-stage process. Thank you very much for this interview for Balkans Debrief. Thank you for joining Balkans Debrief, a conversation of Atlantic Council's Europe Center in Washington, D.C. You can continue to follow us on Twitter using the hashtag Balkans Debrief.